Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, this seminar is called When Lightspeed Isn't Fast Enough about advanced optimization techniques. Yeah, welcome. Um, first, um, I'll, talk a bit uh, I'll talk a bit about what the seminar is actually about. And well, I assume you have a certain problem you want to solve efficiently. Well, you always want to solve your problems efficiently, you're a programmer. And um, yeah, you have already exhausted algorithmic optimizations in some way or other. Doesn't mean you tried all, all possible advantages. It doesn't mean you have tried out, well, the best known algorithm for a problem or whatever, but at least you're at the end of what you're willing to try out in terms of algorithmic stuff. Uh, so yeah, you've reached a barrier there. So you're at a light barrier at what you can do algorithmically and you still want to improve upon that. And yeah, when light speed isn't fast enough, um, you have a choice of techniques you can still apply to get your stuff faster. And well, um, one thing is obviously architecture-specific optimizations. This can be still relatively high-level stuff, like organizing your memory accesses yeah, so they go faster, utilizing the cache. This can be stuff like yeah, writing your routines in assembler using whatever, SIMD, uh, MMX, whatever optimizations, stuff like that. But you can also change the problem you're trying to solve, because often you will find um, that, well, the problem you're set out to solve is actually more than you need at that point in the application. Or we'll see some of examples of that later. Because often you can get by with a solution far simpler um, yeah, than the complete solution. And yeah, this will not only make your working faster, but it will also make the program easier to maintain. So if you can, you'll always want to try that. And yeah, this is what the seminar is about. And some notes about prerequisites. I assume this is an advanced seminar, so I assume you already have written programs yourself and you're a programmer. If you're not, well, um, you can of course still listen, but this is probably not um, going to help you very much. Um, I assume you've tried to optimize them, so you at least basically know what I'm talking about. And I also assume you have certain basic knowledge, like elementary data structures, uh, simple algorithms like, well, searching and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, basic stuff, basically everyone picks up. And I also assume you can read C++ like pseudocode. Yeah, so um, on to the real seminar. Um, the first chapter is called memory optimizations. So this is concerned with all stuff concerning memory. And memory is often a limiting factor to performance in some way or other. Either because, yeah, you're maxed out at memory bandwidth. For example, when you're copying stuff around, you're usually limited by actual memory bandwidth. Or it may often be the case, um, yeah, that you're not using all memory bandwidth you have, but still, um, yeah, are waiting for memory excesses at inconvenient moments. Um, so you should try to use memory efficiently, and the most important thing is using the cache properly. If you don't know what a cache is, I'll give a basic explanation uh, now, but yeah, it'll help if you already know what a cache is. And well. What is a cache? A cache is basically a small amount of very fast short-term memory of your processor. Uh, so yeah, just like you have short-term memory in your brain for the things you're currently thinking about, and well, when you try to remember something you don't really have in your head at, at the time, you need to think about it for a time, and then it will just pop up someone later. And so yeah, cache is like short-term memory. And um, there are actually multiple cache levels, multiple caches layered after each other, uh, but I won't talk about that because this is basically a detail of the architecture we're talking about and not uh, something um, that's really relevant uh, yeah, to a general discussion of how to optimize for cache usage. And cache is organized in so-called lines of typically 64 bytes on current um, yeah, Intel architecture processors. It's different sizes, uh, on other architectures. Uh, this is one magic value about the architecture you're working about that you should really know. Um, this is pretty much the only magic value you need to know uh, for this whole um, yeah, type of optimization. And on a memory access, the processor first somehow calculates the cache address where that line of memory is stored in the cache. This is usually done with some bit masking magic, but we needn't be concerned about that. It's not really important. And then it checks whether, yeah, the memory stored at that point in the cache is the memory we're actually trying to access. If it is, fine, we can do the access. If it's not, 
we have to throw out what cash line happens to be at that point in the cache and load the real cache line in. So uh, this is called the cache miss. Um, well, uh, after that, no matter what happened, that line is in the cache and we can do the memory access, the memory operation inside the cache. And actually, all memory accesses, except some small exceptions I'm going to talk about later, happen completely inside the cache. And the CPU always loads and stores whole cache lines. Again, there are some exceptions I'll talk about later, but first, well, assume we're always talking about whole cache lines. So in our case, that's 64 bytes, and that's actually the smallest unit the CPU is actually doing excesses with, um, which has some consequences. And the cache miss, which is when a cache line needs to be fetched from a memory, is what actually makes things slow. So um, now about some cache design principles that come from this cache organization. Because if you want to keep the cache happy, you first have to keep your access patterns nice and predictable. Uh, the sequential memory accesses are probably the best pattern you can get in a general case. Because if you're reading just everything in order, yeah, everything will be nicely prefetched. You'll not waste a byte fetched from memory, stuff like that. Yeah, it's pretty much optimal. Except, of course, repeated reads of the same memory address, which are even better. But uh, yeah, this is not something you'll have in general algorithms. And lots of pointer change, chasing, lots of following pointers is bad for the cache. So uh, things like linked data structures, linked lists, or trees uh, are things you should be concerned about, at least at the lower levels of your tree, for example. Those pointer operations and this memory, jumping around in memory can actually cost you more than the hierarchical organization of the tree yeah, buys you. So you have to be very careful about that in the context of cache optimization. And you should also think carefully on the size and alignment of your data structures. Um, if you can, multiples and divisors of the cache line size are best. Cache line sizes are basically always powers of two. So if you have another power of two for a structure size, that's just fine. Uh, this is um, for, yeah, data structures that you access very often. It usually pays off to pad them either by inserting a few bytes. You shouldn't make it twice as big, obviously, but you should uh, pad it like when you're only missing three bytes to the next power of two, then make it that larger because those multiples are best. And similarly, if you're just a bit over the size, look if there's some field you can somehow derive implicitly. And you should try to concentrate your writes to small regions of memory because, as I already said, uh, the CPU always stores whole cache lines. So um, if you're only changing one byte here and one byte there, and jumping around again in memory, and yeah, just changing a few bytes every cache line that doesn't help you at all in the terms of memory, because you still have to write the whole cache line. Uh, so just skipping a few writes isn't going to help you anything if you still had every single cache line. This is actually going to make things a bit worse, because yeah, the memory always needs to be fetched, then two bytes get modified and everything gets written back again. And if you can avoid it, obviously, yeah, don't write. Now, this is something that normally doesn't happen if you uh, have designed an algorithm from, from scratch. Um, but if you happen to have yeah, worked on the code for some time, uh, it will usually happen that there are some leftovers from earlier. And those access variables you don't really need anymore. So periodically check and clean up your code for unnecessary memory accesses, because this is really the easiest way to gain performance. And similarly, don't touch data you don't really need. And, well, next thing is about a very important concept called hot and cold data. Because for any given algorithm, there are two types of data. Hot data is data that is used frequently by that algorithm. And cold data is used seldomly or not at all. Uh, and hot data is obviously what benefits from caching, because data that's used not at all or seldomly, yeah, either won't be in the cache, or if it's in the cache, won't be accessed again while it's in the cache. So you should make sure that hot data yeah, is being cached properly. For example, if you have a very simple program that just counts how often each character in a text file occurs, then you have some array for each character code and count how often these characters occur. That array will usually, usually be hot data because it's a small region of memory that's accessed every single byte you process 
while the text message itself, which is just read once through, is cold data because it just exists once. And you should make sure your hot data is cached efficiently. So uh, don't mix hot and cold data in the same part of memory. This is basically the same thing as you have um, with, yeah, just skipping a few bytes and writes. The same problem because, yeah, every time you access hot data, cold data that happens to be in the same cache line is fetched anyway. And if it's not being used, you haven't gained anything by that memory access. Uh, so you should try to make sure that your hot data doesn't leave the cache and that you don't mix hot and cold data in your data structures because this is going to lower your performance. And you should reorganize your data structures if necessary. And possibly, yeah, split the data you frequently access and the data you rarely ever need into two separate data structures, stuff like that, because it can really gain you a lot of performance. And well, that's really enough theory for now, so um, I'm going to give you a small example, which is, uh, well, fast broad zoomers. Okay, um, you're probably uh, thinking right now, yeah, this, because, well, yeah, rod zoomers are basically a 90s effect and have gone a bit out of fashion lately. Um, so, um, yeah, why I'm talking about rod zoomers? The reason is, um, yeah, it's easy to see what's going on. It's a very simple algorithm. It's basically just memory movements, and the actual computations are so easy that we don't really have to worry about them, so we can concentrate on the memory aspect. Um, it will show some nice techniques because, well, from the way um, I'll talk about tackling that problem. We can derive some techniques uh, that are useful in, well, more general and more interesting scenarios. And some generalizations of those techniques are very relevant in the way, yeah, programming and also hardware rendering, for example, is done today. So, um, yeah, what's the, the general algorithm? I chose to pick, well, an example everybody of you should know. Um, yeah, you have just a texture and you rotate and zoom it. And you have your current U and V coordinate at some pixel. For example, you usually, you'll usually start out here at the top pixel. And then you go through the pixels of the screen in turn by lines, for example, horizontal lines. And just, um, yeah, get the pixel at the current position, then advance that position by some delta, which is the same for every pixel. So every X step, you add this delta to your U and V coordinates, and every Y step, you have different deltas, but you still add them to your coordinates, and that's all there is to it. Very simple algorithm, and there's no obvious way to make this any simpler. Um, so, uh, well, we should first look at a few cases, a few examples of this, if you want to get a feeling um, of how we could improve on that. And the cases that work well are obviously no rotation, no zoom. So, well, we're basically just copying the image. We have the same characteristics as with copying images, sub just sequential reads, no fancy stuff, no problems. I mean, there isn't anything that can go wrong when we do this. And similar, when we just zoom in, um, well, we're accessing the same pixels two or four times. So, yeah, even better. Everything that's in the cache gets reused multiple times, so we really get big gains from the cache here. Um, but cases that are more problematic are, for example, when you zoom out. Because, well, only half of the pixels red, red get used when you zoom out by a factor of one half. Because, well, every odd line of that image won't be exact at all. Um, but in the even lines that get displayed in this image here, we have the problem that just every second pixel is actually used for the destination image. So we have, well, half of the data in each cache line that's fetched is actually being used and the other half is just lying around. So this is obviously very bad, and there's no really easy way to get rid of this, or so it seems. And yeah, even worse if, is if you have 90 degree rotation and no zoom, assuming your texture is big enough and it doesn't fit completely in the cache, obviously. Because each, every pixel um, you write here is from a different, yeah, every pixel you write here is from a different line in the source image. Um, so, yeah, those lines are typically several, several hundred, hundreds of bytes apart, so you'll have a cache miss uh, the first time you go through this row. But by the point, point you're through, yeah, you've probably filled the whole cache with cache lines, partial cache lines from the data. Uh, yeah, the original cache line, which had this pixel, isn't anymore in the cache. So as you 
Yeah, start the next row. Everything gets read again. And you basically have a cache miss every pixel you read. It can't get any worse than that. In this case, yeah, all you have from the cache is actually performance degradation because you're loading a lot more data than you need. So how can we fix those problems? Um, yeah, for zooming out, we see uh, that cache usage suffers. Um, so what can we do to make this better? Well, the easiest possible solution is just to make sure you don't zoom out. But um, yeah, how can we do this in the general case? And the idea is just to use yeah, smaller versions of your image if you're zooming out that are already scaled down. And this is called mid mapping. Um, every one of you who has ever used a 3D API should know about this. And this is the actual reason that mid mapping is being done for real-time 3D, because this improves cache efficiency considerably. Uh, it also improves image quality, because, well, such mid maps can be pre-filtered, which are much nicer filters than you usually use uh, in the context of rod zooming or texture mapping or whatever. Uh, and so this is a nice bonus, but it's is not the reason we do MIF mapping. We do MIF mapping because it improves cache efficiency. And this idea also applies to other problems because, well, instead of skipping through our data in big steps, uh, we can always use a causal representation of the data. So, um, like, yeah, a lower resolution image that we can just step through and that'll make everything easier for us. Yeah, and rotation is a somewhat different beast and needs a different strategy and the idea I'm going to explain was probably, to my knowledge, uh, yeah, first described by Niklas Beisert or Pascal of Cubic Team in 1995. And what you do is very simple. You don't render the image line by line, as I first explained, but instead you render an 8 by 8 pixel block, small squares. Um, because the main problem was that we went too far in one direction yeah, in the source image before we reused that line again. So by rendering small squares, we make sure that we never get too far from the original pixel position uh, before yeah, fetching something, some pixel that's going to be close to it, either in one or the other direction. And so we fix that problem. And uh, yeah, what 3D cards do in this case is actually they reorder the texture instead, which is called swizzling or texture swizzling. And well, this is the same idea. And this also has the same effect on cache usage. You're just reordering the source instead of the destination image. So this is not a big deal. But it's somewhat harder to visualize what's happening because, well, um, image assessors in a swizzled image are just pretty erratic when you look at them, at the numbers. Uh, so I talked about the other variant because it's easier to visualize. And all that said, if you just, um, yeah, rod zooming small images, that's, there's not much difference on current CPUs. Because it's sad, caches have gotten a lot bigger since 1995. But then, yeah, this effect was for Pentium 1, which had like 8 kilobytes of cache. By now, we have, well, several cache levels with, say, 1 megabyte of level 3 cache and 256 kilobytes of level 2 cache, stuff like that. Um, so, the, yeah, this is a probability we're going to get completely out of cache is very small. And the crash logic is better too. Um, you need unrealistically high texture resolutions to actually see a big difference there. And yeah, the techniques I discussed are still re relevant, especially storing your data in multiple resolutions can often bring you a huge boost because yeah, you're avoiding skipping through the, your data structures in wide steps and a cache-friendly tra cache traversal order going, yeah, accessing your data in the right order, doing it the right way, uh, can make a lot of difference. For example, also when you store trees, uh, you can reorder trees in a way that makes cache misses a lot more probable, and this obviously helps. So um, next topic, I'm going to talk about something completely different in a way, but still related to memory optimization. Uh, the point is, suppose you're coding some morphing and pulsating object, whatever, some, yeah, techno blob, however you prefer to call it. And whatever 3D API you prefer, you use a dynamic vertex buffer or dynamic vertex buffer object if you're using OpenGL, if you care for performance. And um, that vertex buffer will usually be in AGP memory. And well, what does this mean? Uh, yeah, first this object will change every frame. And AGP memory is memory that can be accessed 
both by the CPU and the graphics card uh, simultaneously, which isn't the case for, yeah, your main memory. And yeah, you need to make sure that you access this memory efficiently. And your code will look something like this, for example. Yeah, you just loop through those vertices, calculate, for example, position, normal, and UV coordinates with your magic formula. We don't care about how that's done here. And no matter how you do it, yeah, you'll always store this data, plus probably some other data, depends on how your format is, in your vertex buffer. And for example, if you don't change your UV coordinates, you may want to skip writing them. Oh, well, because what's the point in writing data? You're not changing every frame. Well, it turns out that this is a very bad idea. Um, I already hinted at this because, well, what did I say about cache lines? Uh, they're loaded from memory on the first exas or something along those lines. Well, when I said that, I actually lied because there are different types of memory. And a very important type of memory is so-called write combined memory. For example, AGP memory, video memory is usually tagged as write combined. Write combined means that the processor, as the name suggests, always tries to combine several writes into one big write, which can be done faster because, yeah, it's less work for the chipset and for the memory. And um, in write combined memory, reads are not being cached at all. So you don't get any read caching in this case. But writes, adjacent writes, writes that are next to each other, are combined so that when possible, whole cache lines get written. As I said, this is much faster than just yeah, storing a few double words, a few bits here and there, because it's a lot less overhead in terms of management. And this only works if you don't leave holes, because if the processor is not able to fill the cache lines completely, then you can't store complete cache lines, obviously. And so you shouldn't skip any bytes at all when writing to AGP memory. And in cases with some earlier processors, this is usually fixed and current chips, uh, but with earlier processors, you even have to take care you write them in the correct order. Um, this is being fixed in the current revisions, but um, yeah, if you have some cases of where things are slower than you think they should be on, say, a Pentium 3 or whatever, uh, yeah, should check um, if they are not being written in the right order. You have to check this in the assembly generated by the, by the compiler, actually. So this is not something you usually want to do. Um, but yeah, this can make a big performance difference, about a factor of four and more. Uh, so you really want to check out that write combining is being used properly because combined writes are really a lot faster than partial writes. Yeah, so much about AGP writes. Um, next topic I'm going to talk about is, um, yeah, again related to memory optimization, is simplified memory management, which is, well, I'm going to discuss a very easy case here. In, say, a 3D engine, there's a lot of dynamic data you build up and throw away during the course of each frame. For example, stuff like the list of visible objects, the list of active lights, instance animation data, all stuff, management information relating to it. And that's all stuff you build up during the course of each frame and then throw away afterwards. And um, most of this is relatively small structures. Say, well, a few integers, a maybe a pointer, uh, maybe a transform matrix. So usually stuff uh, on the range of, say, 32 to 80 bytes. And you have thousands of relatively small allocations, frame, allocations per frame. And um, standard allocators, like your C++ standard library new, isn't very good with very small allocations, lots of them. Uh, so you want to look for something better. Because, well, standard allocator is first relatively slow compared to what you can get with optimized variants uh, to allocate small blocks of memories. It's not particularly memory efficient for small objects because, um, yeah, when you allocate some memory, you need the memory manager needs some bit of information before that block, the memory block returned, so it can find where other free blocks in the memory are. There's some management overhead. That's typically around 12 bytes for usual allocators. So if you allocate structures of, say, 16 bytes, you have an additional 12 bytes of overhead for each item you allocate 
because the allocator needs management information. So you have almost double the amount of data you actually allocate. And also, um, yeah, those memory allocators usually try to fill holes in memory to make things fit nicely. And this means, um, yeah, wherever there are holes, this will be filled in, and the things you allocate over a frame will be, will be spread over a relatively big region of memory, which is not that nice for the cache. And yeah, the question is if we can do any better than that. And yeah, I wouldn't be talking about it if we couldn't. And just allocate, for example, 200 kilobytes. This depends on how much data you need and also on the structure of your engine. You can also change this value. It's not really important. And then you manage it yourself. And well, yeah, how do we manage it efficiently? And yeah, we could do all fancy kinds of stuff. We could basically write our own memory allocation routines with that. Uh, but that complexity, that complexity is exactly what we're trying to avoid. So um, we'll try something as simple as possible. And probably the simplest possible memory allocation strategy is just using it as a stack, just assigning addresses as you go, yeah? And not allowing any free operations at all. Uh, and the bare bones version of that actually fits onto one slide. Um, yeah, this is this class, I call it the memstack class, and you just have some buffer and the current allocation pointer inside that buffer. And yeah, you initialize that stack with your size and just allocate the buffer to have that size and set your current allocation pointer, yeah, at the start of the buffer. And similarly, when deleting, yeah, you delete the buffer and that's it. And there's a function called reset, which just sets the current allocation pointer back to the beginning of the buffer and a function called alloc, which corresponds to malloc in the C library, just takes an amount of bytes, returns, yeah, whatever is your current allocation pointer and then advances that by the size of the block you allocate so the next allocation gets memory after that. That's all there is to it. And in practice, you'll also want a type, soft, type safe alloc template so yeah, don't have to worry about those sizes and typecasting, which is really annoying. In C++, you can do this nicely, so why not do it? And yeah, um, what's good about this? First of all, and most importantly probably, memory management doesn't get any shorter than that. And it can't get any faster or simpler either. I mean, for each memory allocation, we're basically just moving one pointer around and adding, uh, yeah, doing an integer addition. I mean, there's no way we can get any faster in the general case. And there's no bookkeeping overhead worth mentioning. We don't need to have information about the free blocks and stuff like that because we are, we're just allocating stuff in turn and have a current allocation point and that's pretty much it. And you don't have to delete stuff at all. You just call this reset every frame which resets the current allocation pointer and that's all the deleting you have to do. So you actually save some code to write. Um, things allocated after each other get memory next to each other, which is a nice property if you have, for example, a 3D engine. You usually visit objects in an order that has some geometric significance. You usually visit things next to each other that are geometrically close. Uh, if you do things like, well, some culling based on lights or visibility checks, uh, chances are good that stuff that is geometrically close will be either all visible or all invisible or stuff like that. And so this will mean that after you do this allocation procedure, this will be continuous blocks of memory you won't even touch, which is nice. So this gives us, so this gives us nice cache behavior. Um, of course, um, it's not all that simple. Uh, the biggest limitation of the strategy is that it's really limited to objects that have a lifetime of only one frame. So we really can just use this for stuff that's being allocated and destroyed every frame, which is perfect for the type of data I discussed. But obviously, yeah, most of the data you have in your program doesn't work that way. Now you're not limited to that frame. You can call reset however often you want. You can call it, say, once every scene change or stuff like that. But still, it's a pretty limited policy. And similarly, you can't use this in C++ when your objects have constructors or destructors. I mean, you could manage so that constructors get called, but the problem is by the point you're calling reset, 
You don't know what type of memory was allocated to whom. You don't know which destructors to call. So there's really no way um, yeah, to make this work with this simple or simplified strategy. Yeah, so you have to or live with that, that you can basically just use plain data structures without any functionality and just bytes you're copying around. And there's also a static maximum amount of memory you can use, which is the value you pass in as you initialize that mem stack class. I mean, this can be fixed relatively easily. You can just include some logic to test if you're already at the end of the buffer. And if so, yeah, open up a new buffer of another size, whatever. So you can work around this. Uh, but it makes things more complex and is not really relevant to the general idea, so I kept it out of the slide. And it's also only usable for small data structures because if you're allocating large amounts of memory, say a few hundred kilobytes each allocation, that's not worthwhile because you have to make your buffer you take those allocations from very large to make sure you don't overflow. And most of the time, that buffer will probably not use completely. So you're wasting huge amounts of memory or, yeah, for no good use, so you want to avoid that. And so, uh, in conclusion, this is a technique that's not usable everywhere, but it's really so simple. Uh, yeah, you can always just try it out, um, because when it works, yeah, I mean, it doesn't get any simpler than that, it doesn't get any faster than that, so you're basically, yeah, all happy. I mean, yeah, you can't get any simpler than that. Um, next topic is, and last topic actually, is about sorting tricks. Um, this usually crops up in a lot of places. You need some sort of sorting. And um, don't worry, I'm not going to start a usual CS lecture now. This is not about fundamental sorting algorithms. This is about the stuff you usually don't hear about in general or classic algorithms texts or in CS classes. Um, those have some different properties than the ones you usually see. Uh, first off, and most importantly, they're not comparison-based at all. You're not using comparison. Uh, so you are able to get linear running time. So you just visit each um, item, yeah, a fixed number of times, and that's not dependent. The number of times you visit the item is not dependent on how much data you're sorting, which is in contrast to classic sorting algorithms, which, well, visit multiple times. But um, these algorithms don't always give you a correct solution. They don't always give you a correctly sorted yeah, list. And so what the heck is incorrect sorting good for, you may ask. Because, well, if I get an incorrectly sorted list, what is that supposed to mean? Uh, well, you get correct sorting up to a certain tolerance. So um, the difference between items uh, next to each other isn't more than a certain maximum value. So you don't have things that are really far off from where they should land, but it's just a little bit off. And um, yeah, in some cases, for example, there's no easy way to determine a correct sorting order anyway. For example, when you're that sorting triangles, because yeah, you want to paint them in some order, no matter what you do, what value you sort by, middle point of the triangle, whatever, um, there'll always be cases that don't work correctly. And so, no matter which criterion you pick, you'll always have to fix up things afterwards. So it doesn't really matter if your sorting algorithm you use isn't completely correct, because yeah, you have to fix it up anyway. And if you don't, yeah, you don't care about it. And uh, also sometimes it's not critical things are perfectly sorted. Because for example, when you're sorting by the material in the 3D engine to minimize the amount of material changes you do, which is a good idea on current graphics cards. Well, it's obviously nice if you have the minimum amount of material changes possible, um, but if you happen to have a few more than are strictly necessary, this is not a big problem. I mean, you would like it, to, yeah, you would like it if it was otherwise, but uh, this is not going to be a huge problem for you. So this is also a case where you can make do with imperfect sorting. And yeah, the type of algorithm I'm calling about, uh, I'm talking about is yeah, the simple algorithm I'm talking about is called ordering tables. This name originates, to my knowledge, from the Sony PlayStation 1. Um, maybe, inc maybe wrong there, but it doesn't really matter. And the PlayStation 1 is a very interesting piece of hardware to look at because, well, it has support for hardware rasterization. It can render triangles, 
although completely without perspective correction and also, well, at a, by today's standards, laughable accuracy, but it was able to render uh, triangles in hardware. It had a very simple fixed point vector unit, um, but which you really needed because the main CPU you had was clocked at 33 megahertz, so you really had to make sure, yeah, you used all your computi computing resources efficiently. And this um, PlayStation also had no that buffering support at all. So um, if you wanted uh, things to appear in the correct order on the screen and not have any sorting problems, you had to sort the triangles yourself, which is not exactly what you want to do when you have a 33 megahertz CPU. I mean, uh, this is, yeah, you have to build up your triangle list and stuff like that every frame, and you really don't want to be touching that data again and again and again. Um, so luckily, the PS1 engineers had a very nice solution, which is called ordering tables. Uh, well, what you do is very simple. Um, you divide your z-range, your coordinates, whatever depth, into n equal sized parts and have an array with n elements, which is the ordering table, that are just pointers to those polygons. And your polygon also has a next field, next polygon. And um, every frame, you clear that array to zero, which means there are no polygons to paint. So that's where you start off. And um, for every triangle you want to draw, you first calculate the, co the corresponding index, i, which is the point you insert into the list. Um, as said, this is equal size part in z, so you basically do just some multiplying and some dividing, and then you know where it should end up in the ordering table. And then you insert it into that point in the ordering table, like with a linked list, so a few pointer excesses, basically. And if you want to draw it, you go through that array in reverse, which is, yeah, from back to front, and you paint the triangles as you go through the list. Um, the PS1 actually had support to uh, go through such linked lists in hardware. So, uh, yeah, it was meant to do this ordering table stuff. And, yeah, this is basically the simplest way possible to do that sorting, because actually you're not sorting at all. You have a simple ordering table, in this example, I use 256 entries. In practice, you'd probably want more, depending on how many triangles you have. And yeah, to clear that ordering table, you just set it to zero, which is simple. If you want to insert a triangle, yeah, you just scale that so to your Z range and make sure it's one of, yeah, in the range zero to 255, and then do a linked list insertion at that point, uh, at that point in the ordering table. And that's all there is to it. And if you want to paint similarly, yeah, you just go through the ordering table in reverse and draw all triangles in this list. So what will happen is that, yeah, you have basically just changed everything down to 255 or 256 different Z values, and you just put polygons into the ordering table at the corresponding point, and then you can just go through those elements, yeah, back to front, and make sure everything is drawn approximately correctly. So this is not perfect, this, but it's, again, very nice if you can get away with it. Again, this will give sorting problems, especially if your ordering table is too small. Um, but, on, for example, on the PlayStation 1, you had no chance anyway. And, for example, if you want to approximately sort your polygons front to back or your objects, which is a thing that's usually advised in optimization manuals for current graphics cards because, well, they have some um, logic uh, to throw whole parts of objects away if they're completely behind stuff that's already been drawn. And, well, if you want that to work efficiently, you have to make sure that the stuff, the polygons, the objects that occlude other objects are drawn first. So you have to sort approximately front to back. This is obviously not crucial. This is perfectly sorted, so you don't need to do a full sort. Uh, and ordering tables are perfect for that. You don't even need many elements. Um, what you shouldn't use it for is to sort translucent polygons because when you have alpha blending, you need to sort the polygons. Basically, you need to draw them in the right order because else your blending will be incorrect. But it turns out that all types of face sorting, no matter how you actually implement it, are impractical on current GPUs because, yeah, no matter how you sort your faces, um, you'll always end up with a list 
of individual faces to paint, uh, you'll just have groups of, say, three or four triangles to paint, then a material change, some matrices change, then you paint another four or five triangles, and you, then you have to do all the changes over again. So no matter how you do the face sorting, all those changes and all those updates are basically going to kill you. Uh, so you shouldn't use that. And we have a nice solution called Render Passes. This is not a standard name, not something you should... Um, you have to know, but KS will explain it in this seminar later this day. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you should probably check it out. And it turns out that ordering tables are an application of a general strategy to sort called bucket sort. Uh, yeah, I'll explain that. And you throw your data into buckets based on some ordering. Uh, yeah, say you have, uh, for example, a set of thousand letters, and each of them has a colored bar, say red, yellow, orange, whatever, and you want to sort uh, those documents based on their color because it has some relevance. Now, one thing you're not going to do, you're not going to put those thousand documents on a long table, start picking a random element and doing quick sort by hand. This is not going to happen. What you really do is make a few stacks, one for each color, and yeah, just take those papers in order and just throw them onto the relevant stack and by the point you've yeah, just thrown all those um, papers onto the right stack, yeah, you have one stack for each color, and this is what you wanted. And this is basically bucket sort. And afterwards, you can sort the elements of each bucket individually if you have some further sorting criterion you want to do. And um, that's all there is to it, basically. Um, but if you don't want any further sorting, then that rough criterion, criterion, you just don't. For example, in the ordering tables, tables example, we didn't do any sorting on the elements inside the ordering table because we didn't care about a really correct ordering. We just wanted something that was going to be approximately okay. And then afterwards, you traverse all your buckets in the correct order, say in your colors, you have some predefined order, whatever, and you go through them, and you just pack those, yeah, stacks of papers onto each other, and then you have your final sort list. And this obviously only works when you can calculate your bucket index. Yeah, the bucket you're going to throw your data in quickly. Because if you need to perform some complicated stuff to find where bu which bucket to put things into, this is not going to help you much, because it's probably going to be slower than any comparison-based algorithm. But it turns out that it's no problem usually for, say, numeric data or strings because, well, numeric data, uh, it's usually just some multiplying and whatever division to just scale it into the right range. And for strings, you can just use the characters directly. Those are 256 distinct values if you use 8-bit characters, so no problem. Um, and those turn out to be the most important types of data, so you usually get some nice improvements with that. And if you do that repeatedly in the right order, you can actually make a proper sorting algorithm from that that can sort arbitrary data and will always return a correct sorting, which is called straight radix sort. Now, um, this is not something I'm going to talk about in this seminar anymore because, well, this is already the fourth algorithm we discussed and it's pretty much enough for 45 minutes. Um, but I'll prepare a small website with some references to the stuff if you're still interested. Um, this will be on my homepage, which URL will be posted now. And um, yeah, you can look up some articles in Radix Sort if you're interested in how that works. Yeah, that's it. Any questions? Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can use it with constructors, but the problem is that you can't call destructors prop properly. Hmm? Yeah, but the problem is, but the point, um, the question is, um, yeah, that I can basically use a stack-based allocator with constructors and destructors, um, because I can call the constructors while allocating. And, well, the problem is, by the point we deallocate, we don't know in which order things were allocated, so I can call the destructor for the first object I allocated, but I don't necessarily know its type or size, so uh, I don't. I don't know where to advance then. Um, 
Yeah, I can, I, I can overload that stuff, but I still need to keep some bookkeeping information to know uh, where I, yeah, where, on what data I have to call the destructors. Um, I can't just, I mean, I can't just call that for every byte. I need to know the type and, yeah, the size to call the destructor. Hmm? Yeah, but that's extra information I have to keep. I can obviously do this, but this is not a simple strategy. This is really meta information I have to keep. Yeah, I you can already fix that up. I mean, this is the way it works with other memory allocators. They also don't have any further type information, but you really need to keep, keep care of the such things if you want to do it in a general case. So this is not as simple as the stuff I already explained. Yeah, any other questions? No questions at all? Okay, thank you, Fabiana. Yeah, okay.